The title of my message is Be Victorious Just As I Was Victorious. Text is from Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 3, verse 22. And key verse is from chapter 3, verse 21. Let's read this key verse together. Let's go. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Thanks and praise be to God for giving us the opportunity to study the word of God from the book of Revelation through GLEF 2024. In the first three chapters, God reveals himself to Apostle John through all believers who he is. He reveals himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the almighty creator, God, and sovereign ruler of history. Above all, he reveals himself as the Emmanuel God, who is always with us, guards us, and guides us in his absolute love, grace, and faithfulness. He appeared to John, the suffering servant of God. God Emmanuel reveals to him how to complete his salvation plan according to his wonderful counsel and how to establish his eternal kingdom in the heavenly new Jerusalem. God encourages the Christians to overcome the afflictions and fury persecutions, especially the crafty seduction and temptation. God encourages them to faithfully hold to their first love and to their first deeds. God encourages them to read and hear his words with open minds and to receive true blessings in their lives. The key verse of GLEF 2024 is Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. May God bless GLEF 2024 to encourage and mobilize each of you with his living word and with the power of the Holy Spirit that we may be victorious and be used as influential witnesses of Christ, Bible teachers and shepherds and belong to the true global spiritual leaders and history makers. Part 1. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty. The book of Revelation was written by Apostle John around 94 after Christ. As we know, the Christians at that time faced emperor and idol worship and therefore fiery persecution and the cruel execution just because they were living faithful to Jesus. They were slandered as traitors and number one enemies of the empire and regarded as such by many. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. This revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus shows his believers how to fulfill God's righteousness through his righteous judgment and how to complete God's long-awaited salvation counsel. God wants to encourage them to overcome all adverse life circumstances and crafty sedu seductions and be his beloved sons and daughters. Let us read verse 3. Let's go. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Jesus says, Whoever reads and hears Jesus' word from the revelation and takes it in his heart, living by faith, belongs to the truly blessed, he belongs to the truly blessed victors who will surely inherit the kingdom of God. Let's take a look at verses 4 to 6. 
John greets the seven churches in Asia Minor, in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These cities in Asia Minor were at that time very famous and well-known cities. But they were also centers of idol and emperor worship and of immoral idol festivals. But God did not abandon his beloved churches. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit greet the faithful believers with God's grace and peace. Let us read verses 4b and 5a. Let's go. Grace, grace and peace, peace be to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ. He embraces the suffering first believers with God's grace and peace and with his overwhelming, unconditional love. God's grace and peace removes all fear and sorrow from their hearts, filling them with the assurance that God always protects and guides them safely. The first Christians were encouraged to hold on to God's sovereign counsel and guidance. They made a decision out of joy and thankfulness to victoriously overcome all tribulation and to live faithfully as witnesses of Christ. Jesus alone is the firstborn from the dead. So he has become our Godfather and true ruler over the kings of the earth who always loves his children and stands with them all the time. Praise be to God, who is the sovereign ruler over the world. His counsel, his counsel is good all the time. But what did our Lord Jesus do for this? Let us read verses 5b to 6. Let's go. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins and has God and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve as God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. We were hopelessly captive to the power of sin, destined for eternal condemnation. With his unconditional, never-ending love for us sinners, Jesus made himself nothing and came to this world as a little baby in a manger. He took upon himself all our sin and completely shed his precious blood on the cross. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ has power to give us once for all eternal forgiveness and salvation. As Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 testifies, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Thanks and praise be to Jesus. We now find the new life with a new identity to be kings and priests of God. Thanks and praise be to God who makes us a new creation to declare the praises of God and do his redemptive work in this world. Amen. Let's look at verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Jesus greeted the suffering Christians with the announcement of his return. Everyone will see Jesus' return and will certainly stand before God's righteous judgment. For those who until the end rebelled against God and persecuted the believers, the day of Jesus' return is the day of mourning. It is for them the day of the second death and of eternal condemnation. But for the faithful believers, Jesus' return is the day of final victory and the completion of their redemption to eternal life. Now Jesus greets the first Christians, revealing who he is. Let us read verse 8 together. Let's go. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. 
What did he say through his revelation that, G that God is the Alpha and the Omega? Alpha and Omega are the beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet. This points out that our God is the beginning and the end of the history of all things. This also testifies that God is the sovereign ruler over all the history, all epochs, and all generations between the beginning and the end of the history of mankind. He has authority and power to sovereignly reign over the history and the life of all human beings as the creator God and as the judge at the final judgment. God who was, who is, and who is to come means the eternally living, unchanging God. He is the Emmanuel God who takes care of his faithful believers in any time and circumstance. Even in the midst of fiery persecution, he stands at our side, heals all our wounds, and shows his vision, refinement, and renewal through the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. In this God, we may find God's best counsel for our lives. In this God, we may find, we may find God's best and faithful, faithful guidance and absolute meaning of our existence that he has given to each of us and destined for us in his precious grace and sovereignty. May God encourage each of you through in-depth Bible study to find his best counsel and to be used preciously as an influential kingdom of priests. Praise be to God, who is for me the Alpha and the Omega. He has planned and created my existence and guides it to this day according to his good and sovereign counsel. But I lived as a fallen sinner of egoism, rebellion, and lustful desires. I am a hopeless case because of my lustful desires and my rebellion. By God's grace, with Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, I was able to meet Jesus in my life personally, who loves me unconditionally and through who, be, and through, who through obedience by faith shed his blood on the cross completely to give me eternal salvation. In this God, I was freed from the power of lustful desires and rebellion and was able to find this wonderful counsel in my life to be Samuel Abram, a third generation missionary, a global spiritual leader, and a great blessing for the young people in this generation. At the campus, I am also daily facing the seduction and the temptation of this world through the godless humanism and the zeitgeist. But God is always with me, loves, guards, and guides me through God's word and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God that he gave to me wonderful grace to learn Jesus' obedience by faith, finish high school with the best grade, study two majors, and co-work for GLEF and campus mission among the medical students. He is now using me as a Bible teacher and campus shepherd for testifying Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega among the young medical students, beginning from Ali and Hagun and pioneering 12 universities. Apostle John, suffering under fury, persecution, and exile, seemed to be very lonely on the island of Patmos. But when John faithfully held the worship service on the Lord's Day, he was not alone. God's Spirit filled John with God's vision and revelation so that he might celebrate the heavenly worship service with the seven churches in the Spirit of God. In this heavenly fellowship, John experienced daily Jesus' grace, peace, love, comfort, and strength, and saw the glorious vision he saw in the verses 13 to 16. In this vision, Jesus wears a long robe and has a golden sash around his chest. Jesus Christ is the true high priest with all authority. His hair was white as snow, which shows his eternity and holiness as the Son of God. 
With eyes like a blazing fire, he sees through every person. Nothing can escape him. He has feet like bronze glowing in a furnace with which he judges all unbelievers and persecutors through his judgment. His voice is like the sound of rushing waters and his words like a double-edged sword that judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. His face is like the sun and reflects the glory of God. Jesus reveals himself as the almighty and eternal Son of God and Lord over the whole world. John was so overwhelmed by Jesus' glory and holiness that he fell down as if he was dead. But let us look at verse 17 and 18, and let us read these verses together. Let's go. Do, Do not, not be afraid. afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and hardest. What a heart-moving moment for Apostle John. His heart was flooded and strengthened by the words of Jesus' kindness and lovely touch as Jesus laid his right hand on John. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. Jesus is the eternal God himself. He is the ruler of this world and the final strict judge. He is almighty God, risen from the dead, who now reigns as the final judge forever and ever. He showed us a role model how to victoriously overcome sin and death to control the life and death of every human being. In this encounter, John could meet Jesus as eternal God. John experienced Jesus' protecting and gracious hand. With him, John gained confidence that he will victoriously overcome all persecution and temptation. John was spiritually strengthened and comforted by the glorious presence and love of Jesus. When John looked up to Jesus, John, Jesus opened the spiritual eyes of John to see the glorious vision of God's wonderful counsel and the completion of his salvation plan through his righteous judgment. Jesus said to him, Write, therefore, what you have seen and what is now and what will take place later. Jesus encouraged John to write down this revelation that he saw. Until this day, this revelation encourages countless believers of all times and generations to remain faithful to Jesus, even to the point of death. Today's faithful and persevering Christians also experience the persecutions and Satan's crafty temptations and lose their courage, passion, and vision and fall into fear. But our God is the Alpha and the Omega, the eternally faithful, almighty God. He will fulfill a salvation plan in each of our lives, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We may know and believe. God stands at the side of his faithful suffering servants, Shepherd Peter Rio and Shepherd Peter Schweitzer, from the beginning of their lives to the end of their days. Because God loves them, God disciplined them through much suffering. But we believe that our God protects, strengthens, and guides them according to his good and wonderful counsel. Thanks be to God who encourages them to look up to God, their Alpha and Omega, and to live as a kingdom of priests in God's redemptive work according to his counsel. With Ezekiel 37.10 and Daniel chapter 12.3, they may see the wonderful hope and vision of God for the spiritual revival work in Europe, the M world, to the end of the world, and to the end of all days. In these dark times, let us look up to our Jesus alone. 
He is, uh, he is our Alpha and Omega. He will protect and guide and fill us with his vision and revelation. His counsel gives true meaning and true vision to our lives. May God lead each of you from beginning to our very last day to be witnesses of Jesus even to the point of death and to proclaim God's glorious vision as it was seen by Apostle John. Part two, be faithful even to the point of death. In this part, Jesus very personally addresses the seven churches through the seven letters. Jesus says to every church, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus' words of encouragement to live as true victors not only apply to the seven churches. They are addressed to all faithful believers in every generation who hear Jesus' words, including to us in the year 2024. Jesus speaks first to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was the largest city of Asia Minor, a flourishing trade center and capital of the idol worship of Artemis. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Jesus reveals himself to his believers as the sovereign Lord. Jesus always walks among his faithful believers. He holds them in his protecting hand and guides them according to his counsel. Jesus loved the believers in Ephesus who worked hard and persevered in the midst of trial. They were not misled by wicked people, false apostles, or the Nicolaitans. Their faith was so strong that they endured for Christ's name without getting weary. But let's read verse 4. Let's go. Yet, Yet I hold this, this against, against you. You, you have, have forsaken the love you had at first. first. The first love was their passion for following Jesus and the complete devo devotion for God's ministry when they personally received Jesus' saving grace. But with the time passing, their love faded away. Their life of faith became formal and habitual. That is why Jesus reminded the Ephesians of their first sacrificial love. Jesus reminded them what he did on the cross, that he shed his precious blood for their eternal salvation completely. It was Jesus' hope and prayer that they repented and returned to the fully devoted, passionate first love relationship with Jesus. With renewed first love and thankfulness for Jesus' saving grace on the cross, they should now do the first deeds, serving Jesus' sheep and this holy mission of God. It is Jesus' heart that his faithful believers live as bright lampstands for this dark world and as true victors. Jesus promised those who through repentance restore their first love and faithfully do the good deeds that they will eat from the tree of life and grasp eternal life in the paradise of God. Verses 8 to 11 are the letter to the church in Smyrna. Let's read verse 8. Let's go. To the, to the angel, angel of the, the church, church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Smyrna was the crown of Asia, the most beautiful of all cities, the capital of imperial worship. Those who refused to worship the emperor as Lord and God were killed in the most painful ways, torn apart by animals, burned and crucified. But in the midst of harsh trial, Jesus reveals himself as the first and the last, the sovereign ruler of history. 
This was great comfort to the Christians in Smyrna. It is not the emperor or the idols who rule, but our Lord Jesus Christ alone is the true sovereign ruler of history. He is eternal, faithful Lord who even conquered death victoriously and is living with us and leads us now according to his sovereign and best counsel. Jesus knew their affliction and their poverty due to the severe slandering of, of the false Jews from the synagogue of Satan. Jesus fully understood their suffering and tribulation. He felt and suffered with them. Jesus was also severely slandered by the Jews. He became poor and suffered and died on the cross for our sake. The believers in Smyrna looked poor from the outside. But Jesus strengthened them that their persevering faith and their absolute love and faithfulness for Jesus in the midst of persecution made them truly rich. Jesus encouraged his believers in Smyrna to persevere in their first love and in their absolute faithfulness to Jesus. Let us read verse 10 for this. Let's go. Do not not be be afraid afraid of what what you are about about to suffer. suffer. I I tell you, you, the the devil devil will put put some of you into prison to test you, and and you will will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful faithful even to the the point of death, death, and I will give give you a life as your victor's crown. How could Jesus speak these words to the persecuted believers who suffered greatly under the persecution and threat of death? Jesus was faithful even to the point of death, enduring the cross with all mocking and pain because he loved the sinners and wanted to give us eternal salvation. Because he faithfully walks among us, he faithfully fulfills his wonderful promise to give the persevering believers the victorious crown of life. In the face of martyrdom and persecution, The believers in Smyrna were encouraged by Jesus' comforting and loving words to look up to their Lord and Savior, Jesus. With a true hope and joy to receive the crown of life, Jesus encouraged them to be faithful witnesses of Jesus even to the point of martyrdom. Jesus encouraged them to belong to the true victors who receive the eternal crown of life which no one will take away from them. One of them was Polycarp, leader of the church in Smyrna in the second century. Standing before the proconsul, he had one choice, to curse Jesus and worship to the emperor or to die. But Polycarp remained faithful to his Lord Jesus, even to the point of death. Did you know what he testified? He said, I have served him for 86 years, and he has never done me any harm. How can I blaspheme my Lord and Savior? He was burned because of high treason against the emperor. But Polycarp was not afraid of suffering and death. He looked up to his Lord Jesus alone. With hymns, songs, and praises, he joyfully testified to the name of Jesus through his martyrdom, even to the point of death. As a true victor, Polycarp has now received the eternal crown of life. And God used him with many more martyrs for, to conquer a whole empire with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, Jesus speaks to the church in Pergamum. It is the city where Satan had his throne. It was the capital of all idolatry. The whole city was filled with idol temples for Roman, Greek, even Egyptian gods. In such a deceptive environment, Jesus represents himself to the churches as the one who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Jesus' double-edged sword stands for the power of the word of God that penetrates soul and spirit and judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart and defeats all evil. 
Jesus rejoiced because the believers in Pergamum remained faithful to the name of Jesus and did not renounce their faith in Jesus, even though God's servant Antipas was killed. They fought the spiritual struggle of faith without compromise, even where Satan lived. That is why Jesus admonished them because of false teachings. Let us read verses 14 and 15 together. Let's go. Nevertheless, Nevertheless I, have I have a few things, things against you. you. There, there are some, some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to so sin, that they, to, they food sacrificed to idols, and, and committed sexual immorality. immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Balaam's false teaching seduced many believers in Pergamum into idol worship and sexual immorality. The Nicolaitans were Gnostics. They claimed that one could sin with the flesh as one like pleased because the soul was already saved by grace. Then there's the question. How then can believers resist all these temptations and false teachings? It is through Jesus who holds the sharp, double-edged sword of God's word in his hand. The sharp sword of God's word has power and authority to fight and defeat all false teachings. God's word has power to lead people to repentance and make them true victors, even where Satan has his throne. Jesus encouraged the believers in Pergamum to faithfully hold on to the power of God's word, even to the point of death. Here we learn that Jesus wants to make his believers the true victors who eat from the manna of eternal life and receive a white stone with a new name written on it. Jesus now speaks to the church in Tiatira, an important trade and industrial city. Jesus reveals himself to them as the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Jesus sees everything with his eyes. He knows the hearts and the minds of every human being and judges and destroys all evil with his feet. In the church of Tuatira, Jesus saw and rejoiced about their faithful spiritual struggle, how they did the good deeds with love, faith, dedicated service, and perseverance. Jesus rejoiced in such a persecution that they did even more deeds than they did at first. But they tolerated Jezebel. Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab of northern Israel, who seduced entire north Israel into worshipping the idol cult of Baal. One person in the church of Tiotira spread false teachings and misled Jesus' servants into sexual immorality and idol idolatry. God will severely judge Jezebel and her followers, but he will not put an additional burden to the faithful believers. Not only that, Jesus' reward is even greater. Let us read verses 26 and 27. Let's go. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them into pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. What does it mean that God gives the victorious authority over all nations? It means that God raises up the victorious as rulers over all nations who lead seduced people back to God. It means that Jesus gives his victors authority to be spiritual conquerors for world mission and royal priests who fulfill the counsel of God. The city of Sardis was a very large and rich city, which had a proud history as a royal and capital city. Jesus introduces himself to the churches as the one who holds the seven spirits and the seven stars. 
Jesus loves and guides every church with the Spirit of God. Jesus protects them and gives them their spiritual life vitality. Jesus speaks to the church of Sardis, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Outwardly, they had a reputation as believers of Christ. But in their practical lives, they were only unfinished, even dead deeds. They lost spiritual life vitality and did not live the servant life, did not serve their sheep, and gave up world mission. That is why out of his broken shepherd heart and love for this church, Jesus spoke, Wake up! Strengthen what, is, what, is, what remains and is about to die. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. Jesus reminded them of a saving love and grace in the gospel. Jesus encouraged them to hold fast to it and do the living first works and deeds. Jesus was pleased that there were holy remnants who had not soiled their clothes. That they had not soiled their clothes means that they remained spiritually awake and faithfully did the first devoted deeds of faith. These holy remnants formed the living community filled with the Holy Spirit of God, obeying God's will and fully committing to serve his mission. They did not allow themselves to be misled by idol worship, but preserved their purity with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus testifies to them as the true victors who will walk with them dressed in white, whose names are written in the book of life, and whom Jesus acknowledges before God. Because of its wine culture, Philadelphia was a center of sexually most immoral idol festivals for the wine god of Dionysius. So when you drive today through today's Turkey, through Philadelphia, you see very many wine fields. For this, let us read chapter 3, verse 8. Let's go. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know, I know that, that you have, have little strength, strength yet, yet you have, have kept, kept my word and have not denied my name. name. The believers in Smyrna had only little strength. But the outstanding character of the church in Philadelphia was that they kept Jesus' words. Under all circumstances, they stayed faithful to Bible study, obeyed the word of God, and did the first deeds out of their first love for Christ. They did not deny Jesus' name even when they faced tribulation and slandering. So faithful was of, to Jesus was, was the church of Philadelphia that even the liars and the false Jews had to acknowledge that Jesus loves this church. Jesus wanted to keep them and save them from the hour of trial that would soon come. Jesus says to them, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Jesus encouraged the church of Philadelphia to faithfully hold on to the word of God and the crown of life, even to the point of death. God loved the enduring church in Philadelphia and wanted to make them the true victors who were pillars in the temple of God. They will belong to the New Jerusalem. They will have God's name, the name of the New Jerusalem, and the name of Jesus written on them. Finally, Jesus addresses the church in Laodicea. Like New York, it was a rich trade and financial center of global importance. The city was so rich that its citizens were able to fully rebuild the city to its former glory even after two devastating earthquakes. When you go through this city today, you can't visit all of these very bright buildings in one day. Very bright. 
Let us look at verses 15 and 16. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Cold water is very refreshing. Warm water was used in ancient Rome as healing water. But lukewarm water is undrinkable, only prone to germs that cause bad illnesses. Jesus called the Christians in Laodicea as lukewarm. It means that the believers there did not say clearly yes or no for any consequence. Their life of faith was without a clear spiritual identity, without a clear decision of faith for Jesus and for the crown of life. The believers in Laodicea thought they were so rich that they didn't need anything else, not even from Jesus. But in truth, they were pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus counseled his believers in Laodicea to buy true wealth and gold from him through spiritual refinement in suffering, white clothes of purity through Jesus' saving love and the self of spiritual insight. Yet Jesus reveals his unchanging faithful love and hope for the believers in Laodicea, even when they lived in such a way that Jesus had to say, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Let's read verses 19 and 20 together. Let's go. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Because Jesus loves us, even if we would live like the Christians of Laodicea, he stands at at the door, knocks and waits for us. Jesus wants to dwell with us in graceful and loving fellowship when we hear his voice and open the door of our heart. Jesus wants to share his flesh and blood with us, which he shed for the forgiveness of our sins. In this way, Jesus wants to purify us and restore us spiritually and make us with faithful believers who overcome all the spirit of undecisiveness in Jesus. We may respond to such faithful and fathomable love of Jesus with earnest repentance. Let's look at verse 21 and let's also read 21 together. Let's go. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. How can we belong to those who are victorious? How can we belong to those who are victorious? By looking up to our Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus has overcome this world. Jesus gave up his glory and became God with us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he made the clearest decision of life out of faith, saying, yet not what I will, but what you will. He gave his life for the salvation of mankind as a ransom for many. He suffered at the cross and rose from the dead on the third day. So Jesus victoriously overcame all Satan's temptation and the power of sin and death, thereby fulfilling God's salvation work for the redemption of all people. Jesus' heart for his believers is that we make a clear life decision for Jesus to take the crown of life and the eternal life. In the environment of crafty seduction through the wealth and idol worship, the believers in Laodicea were very hindered to look up to their true victor, Jesus. Therefore, Jesus knocked and prayed at the door of their hearts that they would make the clear decision for Jesus and draw the definite consequence for their life of faith. 
the Laodiceans were encouraged to give their entire lives for world mission as faithful witnesses of Christ, even to the point of death. Jesus wanted his believers to make a clear decision of life so that they may belong to the true victors who sit with him on God's throne and will, who, rule, who rule forever and ever over Jesus' glorious kingdom. Do you know Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Under the Nazi regime, Everyone had to take of absolute, the oath of absolute obedience to the Nazi ideology. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer refused to take this oath. He made a clear life decision to stay faithful to Jesus alone, even to the point of death. As a famous theologian, he had many opportunities to continue his mission in, say, foreign countries. But he faithfully served the ministry in Nazi Germany as a next-generation pastor and as a Bible teacher through the Messenger Seminary, Discipleship Ministry, and Common Life. He was arrested and tortured. But when he looked up to his Lord Jesus, who overcame victoriously, Bonhoeffer received new strength to be faithful in Jesus, even to the point of death. Even as he was in prison, he sang the wonderful song. Surrounded by such true and gentle powers, so wondrously consoled and without fear, thus will I spend with you this final hours, and then together enter a new year. By gentle powers lovingly surrounded, with patience we'll endure, let come what may. God is with us at night and in the morning, and certainly on every future day. His execution was not a tragic end. He now sits with Jesus on his throne, just as Jesus was victorious and sat down with his father on his God's throne. Bonhoeffer's testimony is indeed true. This is the end, for me the beginning of life. In 1956, Jim Elliot died as a martyr when he was murdered by the Warrani tribe. But his wife Elizabeth Elliot remained faithful to Jesus. She followed the example of faith of her husband by moving to the Warrani Indians. She faithfully served the Warrani Indians, even her husband's murderers, with common life and Bible study. Jesus powerfully worked through her sacrificing faithful life of mission so that the Warani Indians became one of the most peaceful tribes. Many of them made a decision of faith to dedicate their whole lives to Jesus. Through her faithfulness to Jesus, Elizabeth Elliot victoriously overcame all hostility of the Warani Indians and now sits with the Lord Jesus on his throne. In 1955, Mother Sarah Berry followed Jesus' call to Korea when she was 25 years old. Korea was completely devastated by the Korean War and the young people were full of fatalism and hopelessness, suffering greatly under the poverty. Despite these adverse circumstances, Mother Sarah Berry always lived faithful to Jesus and faithful to his counsel for the Korean students and faithfully served them through Bible study. Through her faithfulness to Jesus, God spiritually revived the young students in Korea so that they received vision for world mission. 
she gave up her marriage and lived as a mother of faith for the numerous young students on campus. And through her truly blessed life, numerous missionaries were sent out all over the world. In 1972, my grandmother followed Jesus' call and was sent out to Germany as a nurse missionary. She was at that time 22 years old, only 22 years. She served various patients, but above all, she served the young people at the campus and the next generation through faithful Bible study. Because of her faithfulness to the Lord Jesus, numerous young people in Germany were able to meet Jesus personally. Many of them, like Sarah Chang, or Ezra Schweitzer, or Daniel Elsers, accepted the gospel and decided to fully give their life for the spiritual revival work in Europe. God is now even using her to serve the young people in the M world through Bible study and establish 120 mission-based camps with her daughter-in-law. God is always with me and strengthens me with his loving words all the time. The faithful God guides me now through his word from John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. To be faithful to my Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim the gospel to the medical students. With the love and faithfulness of my Lord Jesus I may knock on the doors of the hearts of the young people through faithful one-to-one -one Bible study and co-work for establishing 120 mission-based camps for continuing Acts chapter 29 in the whole world. Today, we have learned that our Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the sovereign ruler of this world and the ruler of history. He is almighty creator God and Emmanuel who is with us from the beginning of our lives. He planned our life with his best counsel and guides us safely until today. In him alone we find God's wonderful counsel for our lives. Above all, in this end time full of persecution, affliction, and seduction, we may hear Jesus' loving words and look up to Jesus, who was faithful even to the point of death and who victoriously overcame to complete God's redemption work. God bless GLEF 2024 that the next generation may be mobilized and empowered to see the glorious vision of God. Thanks and praise be to God, who guides us to be the true victors and the spiritual generals and history makers for the spiritual reawakening in each continent and for this generation until our Lord Jesus returns in all his glory.